if you're an activist and you don't have any advocates and any historians in your group, you're not effective. Those are three different roles that do three different things. And for the movement to be effective, you, you need, all, need all three. You need your advocates who are going to go out and speak and do things and make their voices heard. You need your activists who are going to go out and do things, actually create real changes in behavior and activity. And you yeah. need your historians who are aware of what has happened, what's worked, why it worked, when it stopped working, why it stopped working, that can break all of that stuff. What's going on, family? I'm just here to remind you that you can get yourself a copy of my new book, On the Shoulders of Giants, Volume 4 of the Caribbean, by visiting my website www.ontheshoulders1.com and help support me as I continue on my mission to make sure that my people have our information even though you know there are many people trying to stop us from learning our history but hey we can teach ourselves and one of the tools we can use is my new book On the Shoulders of Giants Volume 4 The Caribbean remember visit my website www.ontheshoulders1.com to get your copy and I appreciate your support Bam, right back at you. It's Breakdown Friday. You already know because you see me and you see Pat. I'm Joseph Wood. He's Patrick Irvin. This is On the Shoulders of Giants. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you to everybody who's been supporting this platform. Uh, before we get started, I do want to give a shout out to two new patrons, Samuel C. Hanna. Thank you, Samuel C. Hanna and Eclipse 320. My two newest patrons. So thank you all for becoming a part of this Patreon family. Um, if you want to become a part of the Patreon family and help on the shows of giants, be able to to grow and uh, be able to get more resources and provide more content and just be able to give more, give back more to the communities that we serve. You can support me on patreon.com backslash O T S O G. You can donate a little as a dollar a month to help on the shows of giants. Just be able to, to operate, Go find more information, present more information, and just give back to the large community that we serve or wherever we are. We want to be able to not just serve the community in Tallahassee, but be able to serve greater black communities around this country and expand to around the world. But we need the funds to be able to do that. So thank you to everybody who supported. And if you want to become a part of that, once again, it's patreon.com backslash OTSOG. Um, yeah, you already know what it is. Pat, tell them about your book. Your cousin, go get it. Nah, you need. I need some enthusiasm, Pat. I need. <laughs> nope, nope. We're gonna start that back. We're gonna start that. I need some enthusiasm, Pat. Oh, enthusiasm. Okay, okay, okay. Pat, Sixteen. Hold up, Pat. Tell them about your book. Hi guys, <laughs> that's my book. <laughs> no, the book, the book is called um, the Chasm. Uh, it's talking about the growing divide between black men and black women in America and ways that we can close that gap. You can get it from Amazon, type in, uh, the chasm packed by Patrick Irvin, and it'll look like what Joe was just holding up yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Go get that. And I appreciate you. And one, one thing, tell them about PAX Inc. Very cool. Uh, oh, and, uh, the book is also on audible. So, um, you can get it there as well. But anyways. Uh, PAX Inc. is our nonprofit. We focus on developing strategies to help improve the black community, giving the black community ways to improve itself. Um, and we also analyze information and look at things from a black perspective and put that out. Right now, you can go to the website, www.pacts.org. P-A-C-T-S-I-N-C.org. Yes, P-A-C-T-S-I-N-C.org. And that'll take you to the website. You can check out the Learning Center. We got books in there. It's being uploaded daily. We got we started getting some legal documents, some um, Supreme Court decisions, uh, source documentation, stuff like that in there. So definitely check out on that. There are also a bunch of different ways you can volunteer to help the organization grow. Um, so that's that. We are a think tank slash community action team doing what we can to make things better yep. for the black community yep. Yep. and we be in these streets all right so this week we are breaking down the great the great the great brother the honorable malcolm x um this the subject is 
are black people in America really Americans? So what we want to do, since the clip isn't that long, but because it's Brother Malcolm, I want to let it play. And then it's about three minutes. We're going to let it play. And then we're going to come back and break it down. So let's do this. Not even a student of politics. In fact, I'm not a student of much of anything. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I don't even consider myself an American. If you and I were Americans, there'd be no problem. Those hunkies that just got off the boat, they're already Americans. The Polacks are already Americans. The Italian refugees are already Americans. Everything that came out of Europe, everything, every blue-eyed thing, is already an American. And as long as you've been over here, As long as you and I have been over here, we aren't Americans yet. Well, I am one who doesn't believe in deluding myself. I'm not going to sit at your table and watch you eat with nothing on my plate and call myself a diner. Sitting at the table doesn't make you a diner. Right. You must be eating some of what's on there. <laughs> Being here in America doesn't make you an American. Yeah. Being born here in America doesn't make you an American. Yeah. Why, at first made you American, you wouldn't need any legislation. Yeah. You wouldn't need any amendments to the Constitution. You wouldn't be faced with civil rights filibustering in Washington, D.C. right now. They don't have to pass civil rights legislation to make a Polak an American. No, I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. One of the 22 million black people who are the victims of democracy. Nothing but disguised hypocrisy. So I'm not standing here speaking to you as an American or a patriot or, or a flag saluter or a flag waver. No, not I. I'm speaking as a victim of this American system. I see America through the eyes of a victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. Yeah. He said what he said. Hey, hey. Hey. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first thought comes in my mind, though, for us is, because before we get back into it, before we really jump into it, the first thing that comes to my mind is what's what's our place and purpose here in this country as black people? Because as I'm, I'm hearing that and I'm thinking about the actual year that he's saying this. And then looking at where we are now. Because earlier today, I was just thinking. The sad part about a lot of these lectures that we're breaking down is we're talking from the 90s on back and mm -hmm. they're just as relevant today or even more relevant today than they were then because we have the face or the illusion of real tangible progress, but then we have the results and the conditions of digression. And so with that, with that understanding and that actual reality that we're living in, that goes, that lead me back to after listening to this first question in my mind is what's, what's our place in America and what's our purpose as black people in America? Like, why are we here? What are we doing here? 
Are we just here, just just surviving, just trying to make it, or are we really here to to claim our place in this country that our ancestors built? That's a a, a question that we as black people have yet to answer even though we've been essentially asking that question um, since the 18, late 1800s. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in, what was it, 1905, 1904, one around about one of them places, uh, W.B. Du Bois published a series of seven lectures, not just from him, but, you know, they had Paul Lawrence Dunbar in there, a bunch of different prominent African uh, black scholars and the public, the name of the publication was the Negro Problem. It's actually mm -hmm. up on the PAX website, right? right. And um, it was centered around an answering that question: What is, what is the purpose of black people in American society? And we know what the intent of us coming here was: labor class. Like, yeah, we were brought here to be a labor class, right? Right. Um, uh, but. But something changed along the lines, and now we're no longer the labor class, but we were never redefined, and we never defined ourselves. Right. So now we're still stuck in this block. Like one of the things I think about whenever I hear this lecture or any lectures from uh, prominent black speakers back in the day talking about um, being black in American society, it is the 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 evolution of what it means to even be an American. Right. Like what it meant to be an American in the 1950s and 60s is very different from what it means to be an American today. The viewpoints are different. The ideologies yeah. are shifted. Right. 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 So, our, our usefulness is, has declined. Yeah. I mean, black people in America are not, we're not the labor class anymore. Yeah, we 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 do serve as labor class in some capacities, but we are not the the main labor class that we used to be. To to we we talking from the 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 dirty jobs to the to the white collar jobs. Like we we not in that no more. Right. Well, black people have been surpassed in terms of being the labor class by the Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Um. And you know, back then they there wasn't a classification for Hispanic. So, right. but you know, over ninety percent of them classified as white. Right. A large portion of them still do, but they also claim their ethnicity. They claim right. their Hispanic uh, right. ethnicity, and they are by and large dominating a lot of the labor class jobs. This is why you see even when you look at TV and media and things like that, the entertainment sector, they're used to in the 90s, the golden era of black people, the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. There was always a black sidekick. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, yeah. that sidekick is Hispanic. Um, so there's a there's a great book, Toms, Coons, Goots, Mulattoes, and Mammies. I might have messed the title up a bit, but I think it's Toms, Coons, Goots, Mulattoes, and Mammies. It's a book that's breaking down black cinema from the beginning of black cinema through the 90s. And that's crazy. I was just having this conversation yesterday. Um, it breaks down the the origins and and just the I guess the evolution of the black sidekick throughout black cinema, and you know starting uh, and maybe going back. But I know one of the earliest prominent ones was Sidney Poitier. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Eddie Murphy in Forty Eight Hours, and mm -hmm. and it was just always had a white guy with that black sidekick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Eddie Murphy in Forty Eight Hours was you know a lot of people don't really talk about how powerful that movie was for a lot of black people, especially the scene where he walks into the, the, the country bar, puts the, the sheriff hat on and says there's a new sheriff in town. Like when I listen to a lot of older black people talk about seeing that on that's, TV, yeah. it was huge for them. Yeah, it's like that sitting in the Portier slap. Right, right. Yeah. So, um... So, you know, when we start talking about what does it mean to be black in America, that's that's something that we as a community, as a group of people, we got to sit down and define what our purpose is for being here. And I think that's a cultural question as well, which is why we yeah. have so many cultural issues. We yeah. haven't figured out what our purpose is as a collective. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's go a little further.
I'm not a politician, not even a student of politics. In fact, I'm not a student of much of anything. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I don't even consider myself an American. Now, hold on. Stop right there. I like what he said right here, because people that don't know, don't know. When he said, I'm not a student of much of anything, right? Mm -hmm. Break it down, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm X was an intelligent man, Very extremely intelligent. intelligent. And he was intelligent enough to know where his skills were and what was a good, efficient use of his time. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that Malcolm X had a lot of people doing research and preparing things for him. Yeah. So you could say he was a student of people, or you could say he studied people, he studied the world, this, that, and the third. But the fact that he's saying, I'm not a student, I don't devote my life to studying this. I don't devote my life to studying that. I devote my life to doing this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the part that's not mentioned, but that for me is inferred because I know of the people like the John Henry Clarks who were preparing. Yeah, that's, a lot that of was people who was around him. Right. Yeah. Those people were students. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So that well, speaks to the teamwork aspect as well. Well, I, yes, yes. Um, but it because it, it, it goes to something that we talk about all the time of um, letting the experts be experts at what they do. Mm -hmm. So, it, for example, if let's say I'm a celebrity and I'm a celebrity who has my my light switch has come on and I'm awakened and I'm woke now or I'm I'm more conscious of what's going on in my path right around me but I'm I'm studying more black history I want to know more but let's say let's say I'm a football player my craft and what I dedicate myself to is football and but that doesn't mean that I can't learn this black history but mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a master teacher because I'm going to be a football star. So I surround myself with master teachers and I can be a, a spotlight or a platform for them and help to get the information out and even be somebody who can help support them. But I believe in letting the scholars be the scholars and everybody kind of playing their role on the team. Like you saying this, I don't, I don't have to try to be that black, conscious leader because i'm an athlete because i got this big name and because i might say a few things that sound cool because really my expertise is into football that doesn't mean i'm a dumb jock that just means most of my time and my energy is dedicated to football but if i have somebody who most of their time and energy is dedicated to actual activism or dedicated to history then those are the people i need to surround myself with because when we come together we could be a powerful entity right Right. And so that's exactly what I'm getting at. To, to spell it out more directly, even more directly, if you're an activist and you don't have any advocates and any historians in your group, you're not effective. Those are three different roles that do three different things. And for the movement to be effective, you need, you all, need all three. You need your advocates who are going to go out and speak and do things and make their voices heard. You need your activists who are going to go out and do things, actually create real changes in behavior and activity. And you yeah. need your historians who are aware of what has happened, what's worked, why it worked, when it stopped working, why it stopped working, that can break all of that stuff down. And nowadays, you, you even need your psychologists your sociologists, your anthropologists, you need all of these people and you can't be it all by yourself, which I think is one of the biggest problems we have in the community is everybody's trying to be an expert at everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, like the, like African Kings who had councils and African rulers who had councils and the councils were made up of different people of different disciplines who were masters at their fields who came together, but also thinking about like the story of Sundiata and Sundiata had a Jaleo or Griot 
And that person's job was to learn all the history of this of this of these people and be able to teach that to the king. But it wasn't the king's job to learn this information. Right. It was the it was the jelly's job to know this information and have it ready for the king. Right. So you the got to have your team. But that don't mean the king is to totally ignorant. Right. 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 You got to be aware enough to know when you get in bad information. Right. Because you you are aware, but you just not the master of that. Right. You, have you don't around. have you don't have the intricacies, the ins and outs. You know about like you you know the civil war happened between these years, but you don't know the names of all the generals and the strategies that were used and blah blah. But, you don't know all that. But, because but your what? job is to make a decision. Right, but somebody do. So, right. right, and you need to have that person around you if you spend all your time and this is this is the thing right there's only 24 hours in a day is not enough time and that's where we go back to black people we got to understand this aspect of organization you don't know you need a, a bunch of like-minded people in terms yeah. of heading to the same goal but yeah. you don't need a bunch of like-minded people in terms of the same strengths and weaknesses everybody need to be able to do something different bring right. something different to the right table. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a galvanizer. That's not what I do. So I do well when I can crunch numbers, do research, study, and analyze things, and then pass that information on to the people that do yeah. galvanize yeah. the community and all of these other things. Learn your lane. Get comfortable in your lane. If you're not a light worker, be comfortable not being a light worker. The mere fact that this man can sit here and say, I'm not a student, all right? And we know that there were other people in his circle preparing information for him, but they were content. The fact that they were content to not become well-known, to not try to cash in on his limelight and his ability to garner followers yeah. is what hey. made him as powerful as he was. And not just him, Martin Luther King was the same way. All of them were the same yep. way. Those guys that weren't historians but became well-known figures. Right. But, you know, uh, we used to always say um, a lot of people today have what we call nextism. And I, 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 um, I kind of uh, played that off of Malcolm X's name because they, somebody, everybody wants to be, or not everybody, but a good number of people, I say, want to be Malcolm next. They want to be the next person. They want to be known. They mm -hmm. want to be remembered. And it's not for everybody to be remembered. We just need to be making impacts and making change. Just play your lane. But also, he's talking about, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not affiliated with our look. Because it's deeper than these labels. It's deeper than these titles. Mm -hmm. It's deeper than these organizations. It's deeper than all these. We're, 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 all, we're all a part of all these organizations, mm -hmm. these, these groups, these, these political parties and all these things. But at the end of the day, Black America still ain't doing good. We got all these alliances, all these allegiances. I'm a part of this. I'm a part of that. I'm a part of this. I'm a part of that. But at the end of the day, how is being aligned with all these things truly serving us? Because it hasn't really served us any true practical purpose so far. So how about we get beyond that? Like another speech you said, like, I'm not, I'm. Um, Leave all your religion at the door. Leave all your political affiliations at the door. Leave all that stuff at the door and just come as black people who won't change and bring your skill sets. Yeah, we used to call well, I, I used to call them um <laughs> Malcolm Newer Jr. <laughs> hey, let, let's go. If you and I were Americans, there'd be no problem. Those hunkies that just got off the boat, they're already Americans. The Polacks are already Americans. The Italian refugees are already Americans. Everything that came out of Europe, everything, every blue-eyed thing, is already an American. And as long as you've been over here, Yeah. So, what does um, that mean? 
you know, that goes back to the with the idea of the rights and freedoms that are promised to us by the Constitution, promised to us right. by the Constitution. Are they really promised to black people at the time that he was making the speech? No, they weren't. Are they promised to us nowadays? I mean, you know, it, it's well. It's, not, I, I I say this: nothing is promised to us. It's for us to go get it. Right, but so to put that in perspective, though, the former president, uh, President Donald Trump, his dad was German, and his mother was Scottish. She mm -hmm. was born in Scotland. He was born in Germany. They came over to America at a time where black people had no rights and built an empire mm -hmm. that made their son, I mean, the, the, the um, um, Fred Trump, the daddy, was never broke ever in his life. Right. But he came over to America and made an even bigger fortune mm -hmm. as an immigrant. As a white immigrant. As a white immigrant. Right. He brought a woman with him. And the reason why her being Scottish is interesting to me um, is because there's a lot of talk about how the Irish and the Scottish people were, were second class citizens yeah. and this, that, and the third. They were the white black people and this, right. that, and the third. Well, here was one who was married to a German. Mm -hmm. and got to live in the lap of luxury her entire life. Not to say mm -hmm. that they didn't have any struggles and hardships, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like what what black people that were born in America were going through. <laughs> right. So, you know, when when we start talking about born people people being white, that still is something we see today. Again, we go back to uh, the last president administration that we're talking about because immigration was a big thing during the last administration, right? They were talking mm -hmm. about uh, shithole countries. We all knew mm -hmm. we met the, the black and brown countries. Mm -hmm. And the crazy part about that was some of them black and brown countries actually agreed with him. But yeah, that's, another, that's, that's a discussion yeah. for another day. Yeah. Um, but we also had statements where he spoke directly to asking and trying to implement policy that would bring more white people over and less brown and black people over. These were things that he actually did in some cases and tried to do better in other cases. So that's still something where we see white people being encouraged to come over and just by virtue of them being white, them being American. We talk about the grants and things that they're able to get fresh off the boat that help them start businesses, get homes. A lot of the visa programs have a lot of built-in incentives that make it real easy for those people to come over and get on their feet. So, Meanwhile, you got people, right, black people right here in the community that can't even get an SBA loan to save their life out of a program that's designed to give people like them loans. So I try to keep it simple. I I I I I I consider myself an intelligent person but i'm in i, I work in environments where i have to take complicated information and make it simple mm -hmm. and be able to deliver it to people so they can practically use the information so that's why my approach is always like i'm gonna keep it simple yeah kiss keep it simple stupid. right so if let's say i'm not good at that by the way <laughs> That's all it is. That's, that's why we rock like we rock. You take the Ted, I'm just simple Steve. You know what I'm saying? So let's say a town of black people actually builds themselves up, actually become autonomous, actually become self sustaining, actually become successful, actually are uh, the economy is flowing, all the black people in there are doing good. Will white people come destroy it? Historically, the answer is yes. Okay, so we ain't Americans. So, because I know somebody will hear him say, well, I'm not an American, and they'll try to take it literal. Like, well, you were born in America, then stop it, stupid. Yeah, stop. this, this, even this me is, as technical Ted, I got it. Right, nah, this, right. this ain't a literal thing. Right, this is about how we are treated historically in this country. Um, do... 
does will America give black people the whole loaf of breadcrumbs? Because they're going to give us the crumbs. Mm -hmm. So if we're getting crumbs and other people are getting loaves, we're not Americans. Mm -hmm. If look at the disparities that we continue to to go through uh was jackson mississippi they got the water crisis the water in flint still mm -hmm. hasn't been fixed um we know racism is the root cause of a lot of the disparities that are in these black cities across this country now racism isn't the full reason but it's the root cause of mm -hmm. all of this no other groups of people in america have the historical treatment and the current treatment that we have now of course racism has evolved so it's going to be even more difficult for like the average person to just prove racism like that because of the evolution of it but if you understand what you're looking at you can prove what's going on right environmental racism is something that continues to plague black communities and of course some people will say well they they, they uh, affect poor white communities white people always have casualties there's always casualties in war there's always mm -hmm. casualties in war but overall, do we do will we really if we if we really built ourselves up and became competitive in America as black people, will white people see us as a threat and try to destroy what we have today in 2020? I say yes. And with that, that will let you know how much of an American you are. Yeah, and and one other thing I would bring up at this point is also the, the two different, well, really there's three, but we, we're talking about two different uh, definitions of the interpretation of a law, the letter of the law, the literal point of the law, and the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. the, the, the supposed intent that colors how the law is interpreted, not to be confused with the color of the law. But, you know, when again, when a lot of the statements that are made by our speakers aren't meant to be taken literal. Right. The literal letter of the law says, yeah, we got all of the same rights. The 14th Amendment made sure that we had all of the same rights as everybody else. And then there were other amendments that came along and other laws and things like that. But what's the the, the spirit of the law? What's the what's the and where, where's the enforcement right. of the law? Because right. that's what's another the... thing that's constantly left out. Uh, because we 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 never benefit from the laws the way we're supposed to benefit from the laws because the, when the laws were passed it was never intended to truly 100% um, help us and uplift us because this at the end of the day that's not their job to to put us in a good position to win it's not their job it's our job and we can't continue to expect those that we consider our enemies to put us in a position to win well, here, here's the here's the, the interesting thing about what happens when we look for the government to 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 even black government officials, right? Mm -hmm. There was a number of legislative policies passed uh, during the Obama administration to help out black and brown people, right? But the way they went about helping out said black and brown people, and a lot of these policies were continued during the Trump administration as well, was they look at the poverty level of a zip code, right? And when you begin to do that, you're, you're right, basically focusing on rural areas because that's where most of the poverty is in America, right? Black people don't live in rural areas. We live in the cities. In the urban areas. This, right, urban areas where the income levels are driven up by the suburbs. Right. So they can push these policies out that say these policies are by the letter of the law to help people, impoverished black and brown people get more resources. But when you look at the, and they know this, we know that they know this. When you look at the intent of the law, how the law was designed, it's designed to give money to white people in rural areas while giving the illusion of, of doing something for black people. So. A, a, a example so here in tallahassee years ago money was i think they said like 10 million dollars was given to improve the south side 
So in Tallahassee, the South side, most of black people in Tallahassee live on the South side. So when the $10 million was to improve the South side, now we talk about, let's be geographically accurate about where this happened. So we have a street called Tennessee street and Tennessee street divides the North from the South side. So any, anything South of Tennessee street is the South side. Once again, anything South of Tennessee street is technically and literally the South side. But what we call the actual South side is further down our street North Monroe where the majority of the black people live. There's a, you know, when you get, you know what happened when you get into a black community, you know how I feel yeah. and how it look. And so, so the, the, the idea was this money was going to go into the actual black communities of the South side. No, that money went to the commercial areas of the South side mm -hmm. to improve the South side in the commercial areas. And it did, and none of that money trickled down to the actual black communities. So technically, they did give money to the South Side, but that money that money wasn't put into mm -hmm. the communities and the people of the South Side. So yeah, we got got. So, <laughs> yeah. so that lets you know right there, you're not the American, you're not as American as you thought you was. So, but but we still have to learn how to play the game. Right, Man, we, got, we gotta learn how to play the game. We got to learn how to play the game. And we need people that are actually going to be students of politics. Yeah, That might not be Malcolm X's role. That might not be your role. But we need people out there that's yep. going to study this yep. shit yep. and do it. Yep. As long as you and I have been over here, we aren't Americans yet. Well, I am one who doesn't believe in deluding myself. I'm not going to sit at your table and watch you eat with nothing on my plate and call myself a diner. Now, let's start right there, too. Let's start right there, because cause you said let the spirit use you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that, that, like I, I wanted to let it go so he could continue the example, but the, 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 the delusion that he speaks of it's something that needs to be addressed, right? And I wanted to bring it up right after he said it. Because right now, there are a lot of Black people making plans based, based on where they think we are and not where we actually are, where we where they feel like we so are as a community. What kind of plans you mean? I mean, there are people, I put it in perspective. There was a, um, a strategic meeting that I was a part of here in the city uh, not too long ago. I say not too long. It was actually a couple of years back. But anyways, the idea was to have a block party, right? <laughs> to galvanize the community. Yeah, you already know. To galvanize the community, to get people interested in this new endeavor that was going on. Because the idea was, it was the old philosophy presented by, um, oh, 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 the Nation of Islam, Right. Uh, if you present somebody with dirty water and clean water, they're going to drink the clean water. Right. That was the presentation. That was the, the, the foundation of the argument where people want this information. We just got to find a way to give it to them. How do people when do black people get together? They get together when they party. Right. So if we can get people together with the information there. They're going to take it because they want it. The delusion is that people want this information. Right. Right. So but, yes, well, that, that's well, something yeah. that's something that a lot of black folks struggle with is they think because their light switches come on and they've met other people whose light switches come on that everybody wants this information. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as a historian, somebody who's been doing this history stuff since like 2014, somebody who's been studying this stuff since like the early 2000s, everybody don't want this information. Most people don't. No, no. And, and to, to try to give this type of information in a party atmosphere means you, you, in my opinion, means I don't think you really understand the people that you were trying to galvanize you don't and that was my pushback the people that are going to come out to party 
are they not the party. people that are going to be down to do the stuff you trying to do. It's, Th- those it's are like, two separate groups of people. It, it's like um, when they have a fam you game, and um, you know at fam you games, it's it's probably more people outside the stadium than it is inside the stadium. Stadium mm-hmm. can be packed, but outside two three times more people. Like the Hebrew Israelites to come out and try to recruit at that in that atmosphere, and it's like that's not the atmosphere. That's not the atmosphere to go to try to recruit because, like, like any anybody, if I want this information, I'm gonna go find this information, and, and I yeah. the, the 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 delusion is. Once again, like you said, reiterating is everybody wants this information, and the further delusion is. I can deliver this information within the party atmosphere. Somebody who delivers, who who's a part of giving community information, a health educator, just an educator in the community period, from all of my years in the community. Yes, there's an edutainment factor, but people come for the entertainment, right. not the education. And and we see this delusion replicated all over the place. That was the first example that come to mind. But there have been countless times where I've been in planning meetings and planning calls and I'm listening to people talk and you hear the delusion even even in terms of using social media should we be able to use social media sure and it is logical it makes sense there's no reason why not until you start to pay attention to human nature the vast majority of people get onto social media to escape the problems in their life to 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 find something right. else to occupy right. their time and attention that's less stressful. The right. stuff that's stressful on social media, people tend to block that and disengage it. So the idea that you're going to find this mass multitude of people that's going to fall in love with your movement and start doing on social media, presenting it the way you present it, is slim. Now, right. because of the magnitude of the audience, will you find some people? Sure. But you can you gotta you can filter grow, out the bullshit, right? You could grow an audience just on the spec to get the masses, right? So this is this is but this is the delusion, the same delusion we saw um after Trayvon Martin happened, and everybody was saying that the community was finally starting to wake up and it was the start of something new because, yeah. like you said earlier, everybody in their circle was talking about it, but because they didn't understand the depth of the conversation. They just thought the conversation that they were having was enough to illustrate some sort of grand awakening. No, that's the delusion. Just go outside. Just go outside. Just go outside. It's it's like people were saying that Black America was going to wake up and embrace Africa more after the Black Panther movie came out. Right. Yeah, no, that didn't happen. Right. That didn't happen. Yeah, the delusion. Like, even to, to the idea that Nowadays, I'm an American because I can go get a job in a white establishment. I can send my kids to a PWI. So I must be an American because I can do the same things that white people could do. Look, that's the delusion. The argument was never you can't do what white people can do. The argument was the consequences for you were going to be different than they are for them. Right. And that argument hasn't changed. Right. Right. Once again, if black people actually build something that's autonomous and um they don't need no kind of white people they're doing good it's successful will white people destroy it will white people attack it will white people have a problem with it will white people try to bring it down i say yes because yeah. history tells us yes yeah until history until we get some other information history says yes so therefore you are not the american you think you are so i want to say this real quick Going back to the delusion, we need to seriously look at and analyze our views about our society, about black people, where we are, and about the larger society we exist in, this American structure we exist in. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that the beliefs that we have are grounded in facts. Right. And not in delusion. Right. Real evidence. Yes. Sitting at the table doesn't make you a diamond. That's right.
you must be eating some of what's on that plate. Being here in America doesn't make you an American. Being born here in America doesn't make you an American. Why, if birth made you American, you wouldn't need any legislation. You wouldn't need any amendments to the Constitution. You wouldn't be faced with civil rights filibustering in Washington, D.C. right now. They don't have to pass civil rights legislation to make a pull out in America. No, I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. So. Let's further hit on the point of, like he's saying, you can't just be sitting at the table. You got to be eating. And you can't just be eating crumbs. I'm going to add to that. You can't just be eating crumbs either. You You got to have full meals. Right. You got to have full meals. Hey, even take it further. We need to be, we need to be the restaurant. Having having a handful of successful black people is like um, a person who is living above their means and just have a lot of flashy things. But those flashy things don't necessarily help them in the long run. Or those flashy things aren't going to help their family uh, have wealth. Or those flashy things are not going to be able to contribute to the larger community. It just looked nice. So having a handful of black people who are millionaires or even billionaires, it looks nice. It sounds cool, but there's no real infrastructure for that money and that wealth to be able to really help the people. Now, I'm not saying those people have to do anything. That's on them. They choose to. I ain't telling nobody what they got to do. If you want to do it, if you don't want to do it, whatever. But what I am saying is there's no larger financial or any type of infrastructure that we have put in place to even be able to capitalize off somebody becoming a billionaire or somebody becoming a, a, a new millionaire. They talk about, we well, got new millionaires happening this time and new millionaires happening. Yeah, but how is that helping the larger community? We still haven't aggregated our wealth. We still haven't worked together as a team. So in my opinion, it just looks, it, it looks nice. So yeah, we got crumbs, but we need to be, we need to, we need to be the table. We need to be the restaurant. We need to be the whole industry that's supplying the food. And we're not, we're, we are, we are, we're happy with the, the little bit that we get because we feel like it's better than what we had. And yeah, yeah, it feel good on the individual level, but as a whole though, as a whole, racism is a team sport as a whole. But it, How are we using that? It doesn't even, and so on the one level, right, this is my technical tag coming out. Do it. Because of the way American laws are structured, when they first made the Constitution, only white landowners, white male landowners were considered voting citizens. Right. So new laws have to be passed to include everybody that wasn't originally included. Right. So that's me being technical for the people that would say, well, he lying because that, that's just the way American systems set up. So anyways, moving on, though. I do agree with you. And the millionaire analogy is a great analogy because people don't understand in every system of controls established, there is always two tiers made up. There's always the tier of people that are where you want them to be. And then there's the tier of people that are one step up that are where they want to be. Mm-hmm. And we saw this even in the Holocaust with the the, uh, the Jewish internment camps with the Germans. They had what they call capos that were in charge of keeping the Jews in line. These were Jews that were given better treatment in order to abuse other Jews. Yeah. Yeah, the overseers, like the overseers on the plantation. Right, we saw the overseers on the plantation. We see this. Every single place you see oppression, you see two levels. And it's that aspirational piece that keeps people going. Yeah, you know, and and for the people that are on that level, it's that being able to feel superior to another group, being able to feel fortunate. Like and so you were somebody, 
Right. And in America, we got the same thing. And it's laughable because as we talk about the millionaires that are growing up, we're still being outstripped. When you start talking about resources, it becomes a comparison game. And yeah. comparatively speaking, we're still being left behind in the dust. There are new millionaires for the last five, 10 years. There were new millionaires being created every day, not because they were producing shit, but because of inflation, the value of the dollar. You know, uh, the, the, the amount, the accumulation of dollars and people's banks were crossing that million dollar threshold. But when you add in for inflation, the amount of people that were functional, practical millionaires, meaning they could buy shit and they could live millionaire lifestyles in the same way that people could 20, 30, 40 years ago. That's not going up. Mm -mm. That number is going down. Mm -mm. Well, I, I say it like this. With all the new millionaires that's happening, if if we ran into a food crisis, how many of us would starve, including the new millionaires? Because we know the non-millionaires were going to starve, but even the new millionaires and the billionaires, how much of us, how many of us would actually starve if we had a food, a real food and water crisis in America? How many of us would starve despite all of this money and all of these this new stuff that you got? How many of us? How many of us and I, and I, I asked that because we have no agricultural and real agricultural infrastructure in place. So we could talk about all this money and something, but if something really happened, how would we really be able to feed ourselves? But we, we could put it another way, right? Just look at the athletes. That's what they're there for. How many of them? Well, I think the last number I saw, 70% of athletes go broke Yeah. after they get their last professional check. These yeah. are millionaires. Yeah. Even the dudes riding the bench a lot of the times are millionaires. Yeah. But they still live in check to check. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the worth of you being a millionaire if you don't have any real resources what? or disposable income to pour those resources, to, to pour out into other ventures? Well, you got I, w Go ahead. You got WNBA players making hundreds of thousands of dollars complaining not being able to live. Right. Talking about how broke they are. Right, right, right. So I, I look at it like that. Like, that's how I see it. All yeah. right. We, we have new millionaires every day but me on my me with the money i make right now i got more disposable income than a few people i know that's making four or five hundred thousand dollars a year and that's because they bills and they lifestyle so being a millionaire in and of itself is not impressive to me how much of that money do you get to keep well and how how was that money being used that's the other part to help enhance in the community? your situation and the overall situation Yep. Because, uh, yeah, yes, you need to build yourself up, but at some point, we need to start investing in our communities. So, yeah. One of the 22 million black people who are the victims of democracy. Nothing but disguised hypocrisy. So I'm not standing here speaking to you as an American or a patriot or a, or a flag saluter or a flag waver. No, not I. I'm speaking as a victim of this American system. And I see America through the eyes of a victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. One of the interesting, is, uh, I think interesting and important thing that he's saying is, I see America through the eyes of a victim. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, that's important because, for one, it's true. And two, mm -hmm. that lens affects, I believe that lens affects the way we relate to our oppressors. Mm -hmm. An example is the when. One example is, to one extreme, we are so quick to forgive when the white when white folk do something to us. Or we want to forgive, forgive, forgive. On the other end of the extreme is through the eyes of a victim is I would I I would never let these white folk 
have any control over me ever again. Which so gives that's them that's control a, over you, huh? Which gives them control over you. So, but I'm just so looking at it, looking at it. No, at, I get what at, you're saying. Yeah, but just looking at thinking about what he said, I'm looking at America through the lens of a victim, but then looking at the different extremes of that victimhood or how you can look mm -hmm. at America. And one could affect you the way you want to be radicalized, and one could affect you the way you become docile. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part, even with that, is I believe it was Dr. Amos Wilson that said, uh, when a lot of black people are studying science, uh, we read about the rats in the experiment and we mm -hmm. identify with the experimenter. You're not the experimenter, you're, you're the, rat. the rat. Right. Um, and that's just, you know, that goes back to what we were saying earlier about perspective being any, any everything. One thing I want to go back to with the money thing, I want to make this point because I, I, I had to look it up because I had it in my head, but I couldn't remember the number, so I just looked it up. A million dollars in uh, the 1960s is the equivalent to $10 million today. Okay. So I want people to put that in perspective. Everybody running around talking about is new millionaires, is more black millionaires than ever before. In the time that he was making this speech, those were hundred thousandaires, not millionaires. Like put that in, you know. So I just think that puts in perspective how cheap it is to be a millionaire nowadays compared to the historic title of having a million dollars. But in any case, yeah, I, 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 I like. So I'm torn with the victim mentality thing because on one hand, I get it. I get where he's coming from. I get what he's saying. On the other hand, though, it's like, all right, but being a victim doesn't solve the problem. At some point, we got to get over this victim shit. Right. 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 Now, um, of course, this short clip, so I don't know how far they went with that. But for me, when I when I hear him say that, it's it's. It helps me understand the lens that a lot of black people view themselves mm -hmm. and view America because of the way, the how we talk and how we relate as victims, as if, as if everything that has happened to us is the reason why we can't and we can't do this and we can't do that and the white man this and the white man that and we understand what what role the white man plays. But we also have to understand the power that we have and what we can do for ourselves if we just choose to. And we're behind enemy lines, so we already know what they're gonna come with. So you gotta prepare yourself, but don't don't be in such of a victim state to where we just acting like we can't do for self. We can't do this and we can't do that. And it's just we need white people. Just we're so dependent upon white people. We don't have to be dependent on white people. We could do for ourselves. We just have to choose to do it. Well, yeah, I agree with that. And that's something that we've talked about before. Um, the, 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 and that's why I said when you make those sorts of declarations that you're still giving that other entity control yeah. over you. Yeah. You know, like, like, let's be honest. This whole king queen movement that was going, that was an overcorrection. From people being yeah, it was it was you know people because before that everybody felt like you know black people was worthless, black people was useless. Yeah, how are we going to correct that narrative? How are we going to overcome that? Everybody's a king and a queen. Yeah. So you know we 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 when you really step back and look at it, you understand a lot of black American behavior is is basically victim trauma manifesting itself. Right. Uh, but but for me the viewpoint becomes. Okay, how do we get over that? Because we know as a collective, uh, we, we you know we aren't going to go get mass therapy. Hell, not we can't a, even get people collective. to go get individual therapy. Right. So that's where it becomes the issue of okay, well, how do how do you do stuff differently? And I think that's where it becomes an issue of all right, we got to create a new narrative because narratives essentially control the perceptions of the masses. But how yeah. do you spread that narrative? How do you propagate yeah. that narrative? Yeah, um, I, but <laughs> I do think we, we, we're going to need a a resetting of ourselves as people, though, a resetting a because once starting off at what we what we start talking about, like, what's our purpose? What's our why? Why are we what? Are, why are we here? What are we doing here? 
as black people in America? And can we answer that question? Can we answer our why? Like, what's our purpose here in America as as a total group of people, not just individuals, as a total group of people? What's what's our why? And that has to be defined for us by mm-hmm. us, not defined by anybody else trying to come in and try to tell us. We can't anybody anybody from any outside group trying to tell us what we need to be. We need to karate chop them right between their eyes, right? Get out of here, this eye business. But at the same time, we have to be serious about it. And this can't be anything that's from a selfish standpoint. It has to be from a collective standpoint of what is what collectively, what is our purpose? Because that had and it is going to end uh trickle down to individual levels, but collectively, like what's our purpose? Like, like are we just disposable people that just here just taking up space, just just here, just being ratcheted in a and and um, you know in love with entertainment and celebrities and, and trinkets and stuff, or do we, or are we an actual productive group of people with a real purpose here in America to, to, to do something for ourselves? But I don't even know that we can really have that conversation because then again, we go back to the trauma part. The reason black people are in love with entertainment is because real life sucks for a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. True. It's a, it's a, it's an escape. Right. Yeah. So how do you have a conversation that centers around accepting that trauma, facing it and dealing with it when so many black people have convinced themselves that there is no trauma? So what well, I get. OK, so that will put more onus on the ones who claim to know what time it is to be awakened. The ones who are astute to study, the ones who are come across the information, your light switches come on. Even in this group of people, we're not seeing any progress true enough because that's that's what more of my own is goes on the people who claim to know better not the people who people who have no idea what's going on i'm not concerned with them they're the people who claim to know better the intelligent when the intellectuals the studied we have all these groups of people who can who can tell you about the white man is the white man that what black people need to do doing this and doing that but they but Nothing comes out of that. It's just talk, no real action. There's no, there's no advocacy or no action that comes out of that. It just talk. It's just bravado. It just um, seem like intellectual masturbation most of the time. And it's like looking, looking at where we come from with with Malcolm X. It was I'm a I'm a leader in a movement that's actually happening. That's something that's actually tangibly changing people's lives those people that we come in contact with we can we have proof that we tangibly change these people lives. we tangibly help these people hey look at what look at where malcolm x was we can see the tangible changes in his life i mean p- people can say you know whatever you want to say about the nation of islam but we can see the tangible changes that they were able to make in people's lives to help to help people improve their quality of life we can see that and i think that's the one of the differences between um, somebody like Malcolm X or even the area or the, the organization that he was in and what we got going on now because we're comfortable just talking with no actual changing of lives and no tangible results. And I, I would like to say to sum up the story I started earlier when I was talking about delusion, uh, another group did end up putting on the block party and um, it ended up turning into a shootout. Mm. And then and reiterate this was the block party to do what? This was the block party to uh galvanize the community and to build black pride. And turn into a shootout. Turned into a shootout. Um, I believe somebody was hit by a car trying to escape the bullets. There were a couple of people that were shot. It did not end well. But I remember we had um a couple of years ago. Every year we get a string of shooting between sometimes and sometimes we get a string of shootings and a string of killings. And I remember it was they had, it was having to stop the violence march and like a couple streets over, it was people was getting shot and killed a couple streets over from the stop the violence march. And it's like like um like Dr. Claude Anderson is saying, and he ain't the first person to say it, but he's the last person I remember saying is we keep treating the symptoms and not the and not the the root cause mm-hmm. of the issue. Like Treating the symptoms won't stop the root of the issue. It won't stop the violence in the community. 
it just make you feel better that you did something better right. to stop the violence in the community. Right. What's going to stop the violence in the community? What's called? What's the root of the issue in the community? But treating the symptoms is sexy. That's where you make your money. If a motherfucker yeah. come up to you and they coughing, and you know how to stop they cough right then, yeah. you know it's gonna come back later. But you can stop it right then. People, people will give you money to do that. Versus another person that'll tell you, take this pill and three weeks later, your cough will be gone. It'll never come back. Right. But the question should be is, why am I coughing? How do we eliminate that? That but, should be the question, but yeah. that ain't sexy. Right. But so in a nutshell, that ain't fun. in a nutshell, black people, we got to, we have to answer the why. What's our purpose as people here in America? We have to, like we keep saying, define our current reality and our current existence for ourselves and until we choose to do that we're gonna keep being third fourth class citizens in this country with nobody respecting us and we having to fight for crumbs at the table instead of being able to have our own establishment feeding ourselves so hey man let's do better let's do better we can do better that's why we do these breakdowns so we can think about it and take action on what we're doing so Let's do better. Peace out.